regular plain temperature. Airflow has no effect on temperature whatsoever. So I move this around, I'm pushing air across it, it does not change the temperature. However, airflow affects how your body feels. The more air moving across your body allows your body to transfer heat from your warmer body to the cooler air faster. So having more airflow feels better, it makes you feel cooler. But according to the thermometer, there's no temperature between air movement and the temperature regularly just sitting there. It's important to know that. Now, another thing that makes air feel different when you have air moving across your body is evaporation. Our body is made up mainly of water and our body puts water on our skin or inner skin. When we start doing extra work and get extra hot, our body puts sweat or more moisture onto the skin. The idea is your body knows refrigeration before you do. That sweat evaporates, changes state from a liquid to vapor, absorbs 970 BTUs of heat energy. So it's changing state from liquid to vapor, it's latent heat. It's taking heat away from your body. It cools your body down very effectively. Now in a place like Nevada, you're out there sweating, your sweat evaporates very quickly. So it feels, assuming you had the exact same temperature, it would feel a little cooler in Nevada. Although Nevada is blazing hot and gets 115 degrees, it kind of balances that out. But you have to drink a lot of water because as that sweat evaporates from your body, you start losing that body, you start losing that moisture from your body. So you have to continue to drink lots of water. But in a place like Florida, the air is already full of water. The air feels sticky, but really it's not the air that feels sticky. It's actually your own sweat, not evaporating that feels sticky. It's your own sweat that feels sticky. Another big part of that is your body is an engine. So what you put into it's a big part of it. A lot of people drink soft drinks and a whole lot of high sugar content. Well, that sugar comes out in your body as well with the sweat. And that's a great place for bacteria to grow and body odor. When you get the H back, you're going to be working in a lot of hot climates. So I tell my students, you need to learn how to drink a lot of water. Apply that with electrolytes, cut down your sugar intake, especially in the summertime. So that your body cools more effectively. It also helps with the body odor. Now you're going to be working in hot, sweaty attics. You're going to have to deal with that anyways, but it helps mitigate that a lot. It helps you feel a lot better when you're drinking more of the water. You also got to combine that with things like bananas because your body will lose a lot of energy. You'll start having cramps, things like that. But it's very important to keep your body in shape. I digress. Let's talk about evaporation. In Florida, the air is already full of moisture, so there's very little evaporation. So when you're sweating, it's your own sweat not evaporating, and that's what gives you that sticky feeling. Sometimes in Florida, I used to live in Miami, we'd get out of the shower and dry off, and it was like I didn't do nothing. It was completely wet. The towel wouldn't dry off. We'd have two different towels because it took more than a day for the towel to dry out. That's how moist the air was. Uh, also thinking about evaporative coolers. Evaporative coolers work great in a place like Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, in a shop, you have those big evaporative coolers they set up. They have the water that pumps through it. It's a great cooling effect. A lot of B2s absorbing heat as that water changes state. In a place like Florida, I remember we had the auto shop at one of the schools there. And they decided to get this big fan because it cooled the air a lot. I said, guys, it's not going to work here. And sure enough, it didn't because the air was already full of moisture. So there was no evaporation from the water. All it did was put wet air on them and it made it even slightly more humid and it was miserable. They ended up not using the water and just used the fan and made a big difference. But that also has an effect on how your body is. By putting a fan across you, it speeds up evaporation. That speeding up of evaporation helps you cool off even faster. So not only are you transferring heat, it speeds up evaporation, your body's refrigeration system. That's so a big key part of what we need to talk about, moving air and that evaporation. Now, let's think about your house. We want to have a comfort level because you're not going to be moving air constantly and moving around and running and jogging. There's a lot more that goes into that. So just talking about air, air movement does not affect temperature. Now this water has been in the corner of this room all day and the temperature of the air right now is 71 degrees. It's a fantastic temperature. It's a little cool for me, but it's great. Now what we're going to do is we put the thermometer in the water and it's also the same temperature, 71 degrees, because the water has been in the exact same room. There is no temperature difference. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little experiment. What I'm going to do is take this, this string and I'm going to put the thermometer, I'm going to thread the thermometer inside of this shoestring. Like so. Now I'm going to put the shoestring in this glass, like so. And it still says 71 degrees Fahrenheit. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start slinging this around in this room. Hopefully I don't get the camera wet. Now as I'm slinging this around, some of the water is just going to sling off, which is, which is natural. But... What I'm looking for is if I'm moving this in the air, it's causing evaporation. This water that's on this wick or the shoestring is changing state from a liquid form 
to a vapor form. Every time a substance changes state from a liquid to a vapor, it absorbs heat. The law of evaporation, right? So it's absorbing heat. Now, what is it going to be absorbing heat away from? Well, it's going to be absorbing heat away from the thermometer. The temperature of this thermometer should be dropping. Let's see. We're now down to 63 degrees Fahrenheit. So technically I need to do this for, I don't know, a minute or so. But as we spin this around, it's causing that evaporation. And that evaporation is absorbing heat from the thermometer and the thermometer is dropping in temperature. Very similar to how Benjamin Franklin did it with the alcohol, but we're using water. Now what would affect how the temperature of this dropped? Would there be things that would affect it? Think about that right now. We're down to 63 degrees, 63 degrees Fahrenheit, just from evaporation. Okay. Time's up. Let's think about that answer. Humidity. Humidity is going to affect this. If I'm in a place like Las Vegas or Phoenix, Arizona, this is going to dry out very, very quickly. As it dries out very quickly, that means that water is changing state from a liquid to a vapor very, very quickly, which means it's absorbing a lot of heat, which means that my thermometer will drop significantly. But if I'm in a place like Florida, where the air is full of moisture, let's say it's 90% humidity, I'm going to have very little evaporation. The temperature will change very little. This is what we call a wet bulb temperature. It takes into account sensible heat, regular temperature, and evaporation. So one number wet bulb takes into account both temperatures. Now if the thermometer has a little bulb on it, if we put a wet wick on the bulb, that's our wet bulb temperature. Now we need to do one of two things, either move this around in the air like I'm doing, or if we have an air stream like a blower motor and we put air across it, it'll do the same thing. Moving air across it will have a certain amount of evaporation. So when, what condition would there be where the temperature never changed? Let's say I started out at 71 degrees and after I did that experiment, it was still 71 degrees. And the answer is 100% humidity. If the humidity, the air was completely full of moisture, there would be no evaporation and there would be no sensible temperature change. That's what we'd call 100% humidity. The air is actually saturated with water already. Uh, it would probably be condensation on the walls at some point. But it's very important for us to understand that we can measure humidity with that. Now in the older days, we actually had a thermometer. You could do it with this, just like this, but we had to have these equipment here. And what we would do was we'd use distilled water. We weren't supposed to use just regular tap water. But we'd put distilled water, and in the very end, there's a piece of wick. So what we'd do is put the little cap on it, and we had two mercury thermometers. One was just a plain Jane thermometer, regular air temperature. The other one had that wet wick on it, and that wet wick had to be on the bulb just right, and in this case, it's not on the bulb anymore. Somebody probably pulled it off at one of the schools, but uh, either way, what we would do is it had this little hinge on here, and we'd literally go in a customer's house and do this. Walk-in freezers or coolers, we would do this as well, but it would still freeze on that bulb. But still, it was very accurate when you use these. So we took this, we'd have regular temperature and wet bulb temperature. And then it had this really cool calculator on it. So what we would do is we would take this piece here, we'd take our numbers down, and then we would slide this back together. And it said, hey, what's your wet bulb temperature? And what is your dry bulb temperature? And you'd line the two temperatures up. Let's say my wet bulb, my dry bulb was... Uh, 71 degrees and my wet bulb was 63 degrees so I lined up 71 on 63 and it said my humidity was right about 62 percent relative humidity this was a calculator it was a tool we could use to do that now if I just did a regular thermometer and the wick I had to go use either a formula or a chart but this had the chart had a calculator built in on it man this was the high-end setup and this was a back rack brand which was the name to have back in the day well, it's still a good quality tool, but that's what we used to use. We used to literally sling that around. Now, if we wanted to check it in the return air, we'd actually put it in where the filter is and let the air from the unit go across it. But this was a legitimate tool that we had to use. It was very expensive too. Now we have all kinds of other equipment. We have things such as this. This is a hygrometer or a psychrometer. What's cool about this, when I turn this on, it's gonna give me those numbers instantly without me having to sling anything around. So I'm gonna turn this guy on. So right now it's telling me everything I need to know. So it's telling me that my percent relative humidity, the air is 70% full of moisture. I'm at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm gonna press this button over here and my wet bulb temperature is 64 degrees. My dew point temperature is 61.5. 
So anything less than 61 point, well now it's at three, anything less than 61 degrees will have condensation on it. That means my evaporator coil needs to be below 61 degrees before it can dehumidify. PSIG converted to temperature, remember that. And we go back to regular temperature again. So this gives me everything I need to know on one tool. All I gotta do is press a button. Now there are other tools that do this as well. I have a filled piece set that plugs into the unit and it's a digital psychrometer like this that gives me the readings and it puts it directly into an app, as well as I have another tool. Some other tools that do that is I have this field piece model and this has an adjustable psychrometer that I can put in a return air. I have another probe for the supply air and I can take these measurements, send it to another instrument and actually it can calculate how many BTUs of heat I'm moving out of the system, which is really cool. It gives me all these same instruments. Now this is a little dated because the new version that came out is actually completely wireless. It's just this with a little reader on the end of it. I did order one, didn't make it here in time. Another brand, Testo Tools makes one as well. And this is a uh, hygrometer here, it's a 605i. This, I have these that I can put in the supply, supply and return and these don't have any readings on them whatsoever. They use these directly with your app and you can get tons of instruments and readings as well. So I can get wet bowl temperature, dry bowl temperature, percent relative humidity, and dew point all with these instruments. Tons of different ways of doing it. There isn't a right or wrong way. There's the good or right way for you. The important thing is to be taking this reading to know what is the humidity in the house. The humidity right now being at 70% relative humidity is outside of satisfactory standards. So if I was inside of a house, that would be an issue. It'd be one of the things I'd be looking for. All of this, what we wanna make sure that we understand is we're gonna get a wet bulb temperature. And wet bulb is very important because wet bulb takes into account two types of energy that's going into this unit. Sensible heat and latent heat, the moisture. We talk about latent heat in the house, we're talking about humidity, how much moisture is in the air. Sensible heat's just a plain temperature. Now outside I'm rejecting only sensible heat into the air. But it's very important for us to get the wet bulb because that's what we're gonna need for our next video.